Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day. We pray that you hold back the rains, but we pray even more that you would open up our hearts, Lord, that you would feed, feed us your people. Lord, help us to keep, put the distractions of life away right now and just concentrate on your word to be encouraged. Mm-hmm. Lord, for this coming week, we pray that you use Pastor Izzy now to speak to each one of us. We ask that now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, guys, would you grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11? This morning we're... Uh, we get to begin the chapter. We're not going to do the whole chapter because next week we're going to do the, the last half where it talks about communion. And we're going to be taking communion together next week. So for those of you who've been waiting to have communion, that's next week, Sharon. And uh, she, our, our special request one here, I have to tell her. So uh, I- anyway, today we're going to do the first portion of this, of this passage. 1 Corinthians 11 starts off with one of, I think, one of the most encouraging lines for somebody that comes to me and says, I want to be used of the Lord, um, you know, it could be in any area in their lives. Maybe they want to help with uh, kids in the Sunday school. They want to be um, a light to their coworkers at work. I tell them, look, I can help you with one verse. I mean, I literally could do the whole sermon on the first verse of this chapter. I'm not, I kid you not. The first verse, let, let's look at it together. You guys probably, are, some of you are very familiar with this. Paul says, be imitators of me. As I am an imitator of who? Of Christ. Now this is one of the things that, by the way, I love to get people who say, I want to help with Sunday school. I say, great. All I need you to do is imitate Jesus. And then tell the kids that they get to imitate you as you imitate Jesus. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah. You just um, tell them, "You, you don't know how to do your faith? No problem. I'll show you. How many of you do well with someone who, who shows you how to do something. Uh, you know, you, you're a visual learner or a, a, you need some example. You don't, I mean, some of you are those people, they could just read the, the words on a page, a recipe, and you can whip it up and cook it. Me, I like to see someone cook it. You know, I'm the Food Network guy that watches the show and sees the, the, the chef do it and, wa- you know, and I like to be able to pause. I like YouTube, personally, because you can just <laughs> pause, rewind. What did he do? And then, you know, I, I, can, I learn really well by example. Now, Paul uses the word here to imitate. It's from the, from the Greek word. Is, it's like mimiac. It's literally like uh, mimic, the word we use to mimic. In other words, you see something done and you just mimic it. Just do it. It's that easy. Kid, kids learn so much of what they learn by simply mimicking what they see. You don't have to actually teach them, like, uh, let's go to school and learn how to speak English. They just hear you speaking and they, they mimic what they see and hear and pretty soon they're speaking. And that's one of the things that, about learning is that we really do learn by example. Now, Paul says this, and honestly, I, I've used this verse many a times for the Sunday school staff. Okay, you guys, ready? We're going to have Sunday school, school uh, staff meeting. Here's how to tell how you're, how you're actually doing for preparing yourself to teach. Can you say to the kids, just mimic me as I mimic Jesus? Just imitate everything I do. And a lot of them, you see the faces. That's not very good, Pastor. You shouldn't. <laughs> Why did you go there? I'm like, I didn't go there. Paul went there. Now, do you think Paul was being boastful when he said, be an imitator of me as I'm an imitator of Christ? I don't think so. I think, you know, this is, remember, this is the church that he pastored at. He pastored there, he founded the church. For a year and a half, he pastored that work there on, a, on his second missionary journey. And these are people he knew. And so he's able to say to them, just imitate me. Now, like, you guys know how I was. So imitate me as I, what? Imitated Christ. He, this is where it really comes down to. When someone is new in their faith, and by the way, the Corinthian church wasn't one of those long run, you know, had been going a long time. By the time he writes this letter, they're just, a, they're, we would say, all new Christians. 
And honestly, I think this is, this is a verse for new Christians and old alike, only from different angles. For the new Christian, it's a great thing to have older Christians that model how to do the faith. And for the older Christians, it keeps us in line that we don't do something we shouldn't do because you shouldn't be doing things that you're not seeing Christ do. There's your, there's your measuring bar right there. If, you, if, they, if they look at you and, <laughs> I know I got busted right away when I was teaching Sunday school. I came from an Italian background, working in construction, in the trades, you know. I knew how to swear in multiple languages. And I thought I was doing good when I said, darn. And the kids go, my mom wouldn't like it if you said that. And I was like, what do you say, you know? I really, like, I thought that was the good word. I mean, <laughs> the, I know a lot worse. And I, I was like, oh, they go, Jesus wouldn't say that. And that got me, because I realized they were right. <laughs> Jesus wouldn't say that, so I'm supposed to be imitating Jesus and setting an example that they could imitate me. All of a sudden, I had to, like, revamp my vocabulary. There's things, and yet, even to this day, I still am a work in progress. You know, I met a man, we, we just went on that cruise, and the, met, met the cruise next director, Andrew. Really nice young man. He said um, his father was a, was a Methodist minister. And he actually went to seminary, studied to be a minister himself. Said, this is um, maybe not my calling. <laughs> Wasn't sure. And finally... He says, you know, the, he said, I was a perfectionist. But God had to change my attitude. He said, the Lord spoke to him one day and said, you know, perfectionism is a trap. Because we never can get to perfection. We're not going to attain perfection on this side of eternity. So the Lord spoke to him real gently and said, you need to change your attitude to, to strive for excellence, not perfection. Because excellence, striving for excellence, trying to excel implies that you're trying to become a better version of who you are. You know, it's a work in progress thing. To him, it, it made a lot of sense. And it's interesting that here's this guy who studied seminary, studied in different Christian circles and said, you know, and his favorite teacher, he goes, he, when he found out about our fellowship, he goes, um, well, my favorite teacher is Chuck Missler. Have you ever heard of him? I'm like, yeah, I know Chuck, <laughs> Chuck Missler. And he's like, He's like, oh, I love to listen to Chuck Missler tapes back in the day. He just dated himself. He said tapes, not CDs. So I knew that this guy's been walking a while with the Lord. And, and he, he was just, you know, the interesting thing was when, when the Lord showed him that little subtle difference of what he should aim for, he realized that everyone around him is also just a work in progress. And, you know, I told him, I said, if you ever do go into the ministry full time, make sure you never hide that fact from your flock. Don't stand up there and say, I have arrived, you all need to arrive like I've arrived. Because that's what's going to turn people off. And they're going to already know your flaws and your phony balonies. And they're going to see right through it. And then they're going to walk away going, I don't want anything to do with that. But if you're genuine and you share what you just shared with me, with the people that you're a work in progress and you're aiming to excel... That's your goal. You want to be, you know, excelling in your faith. You don't want to just be compromising and, oh, I, how much can I get away with? See, it, uh, excellence implies you're trying to go for the best, not what can I get away with. But let me tell you, if you've ever taught college and career age, you know that the foremost question asked in a college and career group is, how much can I get away with and still be okay with God? Where's the fence? Like, am I allowed to party and then come to church on Sunday? Or can I fornicate and then ask forgiveness? Or I mean, and they literally want to know, where's the line? That's not asking, how do I excel and imitate Jesus? That's asking, how much sin can I get away with and still be covered by grace? And what's the answer to that? We did that in Romans 6. What was it? Shall we continue to sin that grace might what? Abound all the more? God forbid. Grace is not a cloak so that you go sin extra. Grace is the cloak to cover for the sin you do, not on purpose, as you're still growing and a work in progress. But don't use it as a covering just to go sin on purpose. That's not the point. 
And some of you, if you would just do this with me, if you had a young believer that I could say someone just came to faith, I said, we're going to assign them to you. Raj, I need you to take this young believer under your wing. Just let him show him the ropes. In other words, and, and when I say show him the ropes, I mean take him with you everywhere. Let him see how you behave. Let him see how you handle people, situations. Let him see how you act in private. See, some Christians are like good with, I'll do it while we're in public, but I need my me time when I'm home. You know, I got my own special things to do. If that's the case, you just quit imitating Jesus. If, it, Jesus is supposed to be with you all the time. And if you say to Jesus, Jesus, I love that you're with me all the time, but you probably wouldn't be into this scene. You just stay here. I'm going to go over there for a little bit. I'll be back. You, just, you know what you just did, right? You just ventured into sin. The scripture says if we, he is in the light, if we abide in the light as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. It's a continual washing. But if you say, you stay here, light, and I'm going to go in the dark for a little while, that's dangerous. Isn't that for our faith? I mean, you Christians been a Christian. Well, anyone give an amen? Is that dangerous when we say to the Lord, not your scene, I'll be back. That's a, that is the most dangerous thing you can do. I mean, for your spiritual well-being, that, that can get you in big, big trouble. So the best thing I can tell you is Paul telling this church, just imitate me. You know, they weren't, they're new at this. They don't know all the ropes. So it's just like, just, just remember what I showed you. You know, now that's my kind of teacher. A teacher that would stand up and say, look, you don't know how to do it? I'll show you how to do it. Not, I'll tell you, I hate those guys. I will do as I say, not as I do. Does anyone like those guys? They're not my favorite. I could throw them all into the ocean with little, well, I'm Sicilian. We make little concrete boots for guys like that. You know, they don't need to be around. They mess up. They give such a bad name to Christianity because they're, they're, they're hypocrites. They're saying to do one thing, but they don't live the reality. When we talk about the Lord, we want to be able to be genuine with people and say, here it is. I'm, I'm still, I'm not perfect, but I'm striving for excellence. And my goal, my goal, the one mark that the place I'm aiming for is I'm trying to imitate Jesus. You know, I loved when the kids came out with those bracelets, WWJD, what would Jesus do? What a, what a good idea. You know, when you're not sure what to do in your faith, you, you think, what, isn't it amazing how quickly that can answer? You can have, like, should I go this or this? You, you, you see two distinct choices in front of you. And it's amazing how quickly they can, you can get the right answer if you just say, what would Jesus do right here? Sometimes they'll say, neither one. I'd go over here and do this. You know, I mean, isn't it nice if you just take a moment to say, what would Jesus do? You get your answer. Now, if you get the answer and you don't do the answer, does that qualify as imitating Christ? Or just observing Christ would do that? Because some of you are great observers, but you ain't imitating. And today's message is be an imitator of Christ so that you can have others imitate you. And it helps you to excel in your faith. Some of you actually need someone around you, a new Christian, just to keep you on the straight and narrow. I mean, so you won't do it for yourself, but if you had someone counting on you, you'd be like, okay, they're counting on me. I better stay on the." I know that might sound corny, but it's true. I really think, you know, a lot of, a lot of Christian circles they have these teachings called accountability doctrines. And they teach um, that, you know, you're, you need to find an accountability partner and, and be accountable to them. And I tell you, honestly, I, I have a red flag I, ever, I have ever since that teaching sprung up a couple decades ago. And the red flag is this. Whenever you say, I'm accountable to another man, I'm, I gotta, the Bible says we all have desperately wicked hearts. Anyone amen to that? You can say I'm accountable to another man. And you know, when that other man is around, I can put on a good show. But it's when he's gone that the real, you know, the real genuine mark of a man's character isn't how he acts when everyone else is looking. It's how he behaves when no one's looking. 
when only God sees. That's the real, genuine measure of a man's character. How do you behave when nobody's watching? Are you imitating Jesus all the time? And honestly, I cannot, and if you'd like to, you know, point it out to me, if you can find it, I've taught the entire Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, had the privilege of doing it on a second time, passing through this time, to 15 years. I'm not fast. 15 years of doing it, and I can't find the accountability to another man verse. But I can tell you, there's a verse about being accountable to God for every single stinking thing you do, good or evil. And I can teach you that someday you'll stand before him and give an answer for everything you did. And I must rather teach you that because, I don't know about you, but that makes me stay straight better than worrying about some guy watching me. If I'm reminded that I'm going to someday give an answer to God for everything I did, whether it's good or evil, you ask me where this is. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul, when he's into chapter 6, when he's talking about how these bodies are just earthly tents, and then someday we get to upgrade from this earthly tent to a, what, what did he call it? A mansion. A building not made by human hands, but made by God. Eternal in the heavens. So he says, in that very passage... Whether we like it or not, we all are going to give an answer for everything we've done, whether good or evil, before the Lord. That means I'm accountable to God. I'm much more worried about what he thinks than what another man thinks. Now, if I keep that as a priority, will it affect how I treat other people? Absolutely. But if I think I only have to be accountable to men, my desperately wicked heart will start to figure out ways to just not have that guy around when I want to sin. Don't you need to go help someone else? Or, you know, maybe you should take on another accountability partner that needs more help. I'm doing pretty good right now. And though, it, but inwardly, you could be doing terrible. That's the problem with a desperately wicked heart. Now, can I pull that line with God? No. He, so it's hard to snow him. He knows everything. You can't even go to him and say, I'm doing great when you're not doing great. He knows. I tell people... Don't try to, you know, they're like, but should I just confess I'm doing great? No. That's a lie. You can say, I would like to be doing great, but if you're not doing great, you don't have to go to God and say, I'm doing great when I'm not. There's a whole group of name it and claim it, health and wealth, blab it and grab it, prosperity doctrine folks that teach those things and say, if you say you're not feeling well, then that's a negative confession. Listen, I'm all for being positive, but I'm not for lying, especially to yourself. If you're sick, you're sick. Now, if I'm sick, I got a really great verse for you. Jesus said it's only the ones that aren't well that need a what? A doctor. And who's the great doctor, the physician he's talking about? Himself, Jesus. Man, when I don't feel well, then I got the answer. I know who to go to. He happens to be the same guy I'm supposed to be imitating so that I can be an example to others as I imitate him. I don't have to lie about how I'm doing when it comes to, to my day. If I'm not doing good, I can say, you know, I'm just having a bad day. And can Jesus identify? Did he ever have any bad days? <laughs> Did he know what it was like? Sure. He's the one that is the example for us. We have to learn to imitate him. In all that we do, we should be just a literally a living like a reflection of Christ to the world just through our behavior. And when they go, man, there is something different about you. You don't act like everyone. There's something. And hopefully you have this happen. As you imitate the Lord, someone will come up to you and go, wow, there's, a, there's a, like a light about you. There's a, th this, this is the new agey thing that now today they use this lingo. You have a golden aura. I've gotten that in KTA a couple times. Golden aura. That, that's a new age way of, you know what, I don't knock that. I just say, wow, they're perceptive. But see, I get to tell them where the aura came from. Because it's not my light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And Jesus said, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man opens the door of his heart, I will come in and I will sup with him. I will, he says, you just abide in me, I will abide in you. I will come in and remain with you. And when they say, you got a golden aura, Tim, look at that aura. You go, that's, that's the Lord in me. 
I'm just, I try to keep my lamp clean, you know. I, when I taught this to the kids, I said, this is 35 years ago when I got saved in northern Arizona. We had a lot of um, houses didn't even on the grid. So anyone know what a, a kerosene or oil lamp is? That's what we use for light at night, okay? And, and, you know, and it was common. Everyone knew how to work one of those. You know, you trim the wick, you get it just right. You know, when you get it too high, what happens when the flame gets too big to the, to the inside of the little glass dome? It gets smoky and sooty and it gets all black. And it doesn't matter if you dial the, 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 the wick to the right height and get it glowing just right. If, if, the, if the glass is all dirty, the light inside doesn't really shine out. And so the man who taught me about Jesus said, you know, Jesus is that light inside of us. And Jesus said, don't put your light, your lamp under a bushel. You know, don't hide it. Put it on a lampstand where it's a light to, to all who need it. He said, but the problem is some of us have Jesus inside, but we got so much soot on our glass that, that it's so dirty that we haven't asked the Lord, create in me a what? A clean heart. Renew a right spirit. Cleanse me. Wash me. Make me clean. You know, when we ask the Lord to do that, it's like he just, this is how the, the youth pastor taught me. It's like he took the dome off, cooled it down, and he, wa and he washed it spick and span. And he puts it back over that la light, and that's you. When, when, you're, when your dome is over that and Jesus is inside, people go, wow, look at that light. That's, you got a light about you. Now, if you have never heard that in your Christian faith, let me tell you, that's something to aspire to, to, to have happen. Hopefully, you're imitating Jesus so much that people are going, wow, you just glow. And if they never say that, what are you doing? Who are you imitating? Are you imitating him? Are you letting him? Is he in your heart? Now, some of you will get mad at me for saying this, but it's true. Are you living in a way that you could do exactly what Paul just said to the Corinthian church? Could you say to a church, just imitate me as I imitate Christ if you don't know how to do it? I mean, stand up. You, you can come stand up here. Tell everybody you want to know how to do this? I'll show you. And if, you, if you're sitting there going, no way, don't call on me, pastor. Then you, and, and, and if in particular you're going, well, there's a few things I wouldn't want them to imitate. Maybe you got some secret pet sins that you only do when no one's around. You just identified the areas you need to clean up in your life. And the only way to clean them up is go to the Lord and say, Lord, cleanse my glass. Wash me clean. Because that's what he came to do. The blood of Jesus was spilt so that our sins could be removed. For the remission, that means the removal, not to just covering up. Jesus doesn't cover us with his blood. He uses his blood as the detergent to clean away our sin and make that glass completely clean. And that's what I, I just wish that every one of you could just say, no problem. I'm going to do that all week this week. I'm going to just give it a whirl. And if you don't have a new believer around you, let me suggest that you start praying the Lord bring you one. Because let me tell you, there's enough of them out there that they need someone to help show them they need someone to imitate someone to show them how to walk the walk of faith in a genuine way with a living example a real person yes you will make mistakes but you can even use the mistakes to say look you know we are going to make mistakes we're going to fall down you got to dust yourself off and get back up and keep going it's called persevering in the faith do we have to persevere yes we live in a culture that doesn't want to persevere at anything. I failed at that once. I'm never trying it again. Do you know that we have a whole generation that is growing up with, with this idea that if they don't get it right the first time, they should just quit? And I'm like, where did you learn that? I know my kids didn't learn it from me. Man, if I don't get it right the first time, Daniel, will I keep trying? <laughs> He's just like she said. Just a bit. When I see my kids not trying, I'm like, do you think I would do that? Because I was never taught quit trying. How, how many of you grew up where you were taught you are going to fail, but it's okay. You just have, I mean, you don't fall off the bike once and go, well, bike riding's not for me. 
I wanted to learn to ride, but I fell once, so I'm not going to try anymore. Man, I don't know how many times I wiped out on a bike, but I sure kept going. Eventually, I got the thing to stay upright. And it wasn't too much longer. I was going, look, no hands. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things you got to put effort in, right? And this, just to learn anything, you're going to have fails. I found it really interesting that one of the top, top athletes just came on my Facebook uh, a week, about a week and a half ago, and it was a video of him, and he said, if you want to be excellent, you have to be willing to fail. Failure is just part of the learning process. And it was interesting that it had m like tens of millions of views. And I thought, man, you know, this is, this is something that this generation needs to hear. But they don't just need to hear it. What do they need? Someone to show them that, yes, we do fall down. But just because we f fell down doesn't mean we quit trying to ride the bike. Just because you fall down in your faith doesn't mean you quit running the race. You get back up and keep running, right? Dust yourself off and keep going. There's a, there's a goal, man. I, this, this faith thing, Paul said there's a, there's a finish line. Fix your eyes on who? On Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. And when you feel weary, he said, just consider him. It says, for the joy be set before him, he endured the cross despising the shame. He went through that humiliation because his focus was on the end goal. We need to be people that show people how to put their eyes on the end goal. We got to... Guys, it's not something... Really, it's more of an attitude, isn't it? That we show than, than say. It's hard for me to tell you this. In fact, this sermon would be easier for you to say, you want to know how the sermon goes? Just follow me. Hang out with me all week. I'll show you. See how I am with people. I don't really need to, like, like some of the young men are like, how do we get to train to be a pastor? I like how I got the privilege to train with Pastor John Higgins in, uh, in Calvary Tri City. He never said we're going to have a class on how to be a pastor. He said, just come with me. And he literally let me shadow him everywhere. I saw how he acted with the widows. I saw how he acted when he went to the hospital to visit someone. I saw how he you know, would pray for people when they were sick. I saw him give the message when he was exhausted and then kept up all night from different situations and in crazy attacks. And he, never, he just soldiered on. And he taught me that you don't quit is not even like, it's not an option, right? It's not even, a, it's like quit, forget quit. No, we ain't quitting. I, I'm pressing on. You know when Paul said, I press on for the high and upward calling the mark? I'm pressing. You know, kids today need to see people who can press on. Now, some of you have this developed in you very well. You have that in your character. And you think, I don't really have anything to show any youngster. But you don't realize that that's so critical to this generation. They need examples of how to s just persevere, how to press on when things get tough and dig in and just say, no, I'm not quitting. I'm not going to quit on my marriage. I'm not going to quit on my job. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to persevere. And Paul, I don't think he was bragging at all when he said, be an imitator of me as I'm an imitator of Christ. I think he was just saying, this is how you do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we had the privilege to be together. Thanks for keeping the rain back. Let us please get all this put away before it comes. And uh, I just thank you, Lord, for your kindness to our fellowship that we can meet out on a beach in Hawaii. You are indeed a great God. And to you, we give all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. And we ask that you just f set us free. Any shackles that are holding us back, any weights of sin that just weigh us down, Lord, lift them from us right now. Free us to continue to follow you with full stride, Lord, that we could run freely before you and, and toward you, Lord, as we help lead others to you. We ask it now in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. If you don't mind, uh, let's stand sing a closing song and send you off in the joy of the Lord. And Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, amazinggracekona.com 
and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.